We are so fortunate to have him here as one of our regular resident speakers, Michael Mapes. Thank you. I'm really happy to be back. I've been keeping up with what's been happening here on YouTube, and it seems like you guys have some really um, phenomenal things going on here. Uh, as some of you know, I'm getting married to my partner on September 15th. And, and he's not here with me, so I feel I have license to say whatever. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that I've realized about sort of planning a wedding and going through this whole process is that it's kind of like living your life in a pressure cooker because you have to consider all of these really big things like uh, how you feel about money and whether or not you want to have children and how you communicate with one another. And then you have to deal with all of these people like your friends and your family and florists and caterers who have to bring all of these people together for a relatively short amount of time without a lot of room for error, then it's kind of like throwing a party that you're almost certain other people will bitch about because no matter what you do or how you do it, somebody will be displeased with the choices that you've made. And what I've realized going through this whole process is how totally easy it is for me to completely lose my mind, for me to completely get knocked down into a really unspiritual place. And I started thinking about and considering uh, why that was, why was it so easy for me when I spend so much time thinking about what kind of a person I want to be, and I spend so much time working with people who are improving their lives, what was it about this process that was causing me to lose my sense of balance? and my sense of centeredness. And as I, as I looked at that and as I thought about that more and more, what I started to realize was that there was a really big disconnect between the things that I knew on one level, like if I'm patient, if I'm kind, if I'm loving, I will have less anxiety both in the short and long term and things will work out you know, better. And then how I was living and what I was feeling on another level, which is, it's just a small thing so it's okay to get frustrated. Or, it's my party, so it's okay to get mad at this person or that person. Maybe you have that in your own life. You think you'll just do a little judgment or just be a little frustrated over here because it's small and won't affect anything else in your life. So all of these things kind of then start to build up. It's like death by a thousand cuts. And then all of a sudden, I'm like creating and starring in all of these sort of miniature psychodramas. And part of what we're asked to do in our spiritual journey is consider life's big questions, these sometimes seemingly abstract questions. Where am I going? Why am I here? How do I feel about death? What's my purpose? What makes a life worth living? What makes a meaningful life? And these are really important questions, and if you ask these questions, they will enrich your life. They will help you to more fully engage with your spiritual journey. They will help you to become more conscious. But the true test of our spiritual mettle is not just our willingness to ask these questions. It's being able to apply all of the things that we learn, all of the things that we know to be true when we're faced with the rigors of our daily experience. That's a challenge. So it's not enough to just say, I believe it's a good idea to be a forgiving person, or I think it's a good idea to be a loving person. It's when you find yourself in this moment of, frustration or in a moment of struggle or in a moment of hardship? Can I actually apply all of these different things that I know to be true? So that's what I want to talk about today, sort of the intersection between theory and praxis. And I think that this is really one of the keys to our happiness because what I know from my own life is I'm not always the happiest in situations where I get to be right. I'm the happiest in situations where I have been the best person that I am capable of being in a situation. I am happiest in situations where I have showed up in the best way possible, regardless of what the outcome is. So the situations where I let go of my fear, the situations where I release my limiting beliefs, the situations where I act in a loving way, these are the situations that allow me to remain centered in myself. And then these are the situations that actually always bring me closer to getting what I want and getting what 
I need, and I think that's one of the empowerments of spirituality, that if you're willing to let go of your fears, if you're willing to move past your limiting beliefs, and if you're willing to allow the same forces that govern the cosmos to govern your own life, then you will find peace. So how do we get there? How do we use the powerful emotion and feelings of inspiration that spirituality inspires in us? Because, you know, when we come to spirituality or when we come to meditation or we come to intuition or we come to the tenets of non-judgment, it inspires something in us, it activates something in us. So how then do we call upon that power when the world doesn't seem to reflect that inspiration? Or how do we activate our sort of more powerful self in a moment of deep frustration? And I wanna talk in just a moment about the sort of practical, everyday way that you can approach this, both from how you, you think about your life and then the things that you actually do. But I want to begin uh, at a place just a little bit before that, which is I want to start by talking about the sort of metaphysical underpinnings or the metaphysical explanation for what's happening in those moments when we go from being our calm and centered self to when we go to being our crazy, angry, impatient, overwhelmed, order muppet, whatever, self. And we all know when that's happening, right? You can feel it in, in your mind. I can feel it in my body. I know what it feels like when I'm about to get in a fight. I know what it feels like when I'm about to say something hurtful. I know what it feels like when I'm saying something hurtful to myself and not being kind to myself. I mean, literally, your nervous system changes, your physiology changes many, many times. It's like I'm almost watching someone else like outside my body, like he's gonna do it, and I can't like really stop myself. You know, like I know I'm gonna do something really stupid, but I, it's like I have no power to stop myself. And then it's really, really easy to feel balanced and centered when you're doing something spiritual. I mean, it's not a challenge to feel balanced after an hour of meditation. It's not a challenge to feel spiritual and connected, you know, when you're doing your daily affirmations or when you're doing yoga or when you're doing exercise. But the reason why we feel balanced in those moments of spiritual practice, and I think this is important, the reason why we feel balanced and connected and centered in those moments of, moments of spiritual practice, metaphysically, is because on some level, and we all have varying levels of how conscious we are about this process, but on some level, in those moments, when you're meditating, when you're exercising, when you're doing your daily affirmations, when you're listening to an inspirational speaker, when you're reading a self-help book, whatever, you are in those moments perceiving a deeper level of truth. You are in those moments perceiving the world more as it is meant to be seen. And those are the truths like you are lovable and you are worth it. Those are the truths that, are, that you know you are connected. Those are the truths that there's something mysterious in the world and it's all right to sit in that mystery. These are the truths that there is divinity within us and, and within the world around us and within the people that are around us. But metaphysically what happens is we then find that link severed. We then get disconnected from all of these things that we know to be the case. And once you stop seeing the divinity in yourself, or once you stop seeing, in fact, that you are divine, then what chance do you have of seeing that or recognizing that in someone else? If you do not feel centered and connected to all of the parts of yourself, the good, the bad, you know, the light, the shadow, then what chance do you have of feeling connected even to someone who is favorable to you, let alone somebody who really challenges you? And, and the answer is that you don't have much of a chance. And then what happens is we start getting in this way of viewing the world where it's sort of me against everybody else, or the world is divided into two categories, my interest and everything that is not my interest or my interests and those who support my interests and those who do not support my interests. So what's happening? Why do we lose this sense of connection? Why do we lose this sense of centeredness? I think many, many times 
It starts either from fear or because our feelings get hurt. I know that this is the case for me because when my feelings get hurt, I feel about this big, I feel small, I feel very little. And once my feelings are hurt, because when our feelings are hurt, it's like our way of viewing the world is right no matter what. It's like if my feelings are hurt, I must automatically be right. And then we get into this way of sort of, it just is, it's very, very easy to start dividing our actions into justified and unjustified. That person said something cruel to me, so I was justified in my harsh response. That person did something to me five years ago, so I'm justified in withholding my love from them now. Once you get to this place, you don't lean into your vulnerability. You don't say, what is it about this situation that has me so affected in the first place? Instead, what you do is you go to a place of defensiveness. And when you're in a place of defensiveness, you are not going to be your authentic self. Once you're in a place of defensiveness instead of defenselessness, Showing yourself to the world is too risky a proposition. I think it's a really important exercise to think back in your life to when was your first experience that taught you that just being yourself was risky. I think that's really a key piece to any of our self-awareness sort of a journey. And what happens is when you get in this very constricted state of awareness, when you get in this very limited way of viewing the world, what you become obsessed with is not true. What you become obsessed with is how can I be right? Not what can I, not, not how can I do the right thing? Not how can I be the right thing in relationship to this situation, but how can I be right? And once you're at that point, you are seeing the world from an extremely limited vantage point. This is, of course, the vantage point that the ego prefers. This is the way that your lower self would prefer that you see the world, because this is the vantage point of poor me. This is the vantage point of I can't succeed. This is the vantage point of I shouldn't try, because every time I do, someone or something mucks it up. And this is not a vantage point that gives you the kind of life that you want to have. Because not only then does this way of living impede spirituality's life from being light from being made manifest in your life, not only does it impede you from becoming more self-aware and becoming more enlightened, but it's actually what makes you unattractive to others. It's actually what makes your life very difficult because Nobody wants to hire that person. Nobody wants to be in a relationship with that person. You're, you know, the poor me person, I give this person, that's not the person you want to get a drink with. That's not the person you want to network with. You know, so it actually then, in all of these practical ways, just by the way that you decide to view yourself, makes your life more difficult. And so what's happening in these moments is that our powerful self, our centered self, our balanced self vacates the car, and then our lower self, our ego self, is more than happy to sit in the driver's seat. I don't know about you, but usually once my ego's running the show, I find it hard to stop myself from creating a bigger mess. Like everything that I do at that point that is, that is aimed at trying to fix it makes it worse. <laughs> And everything I say to fix something over here involves me in some other huge thing over here. I've been really obsessed with um, two TV shows recently. Uh, maybe you've seen some of them. One of them is uh, Political Animals with Sigourney Weaver. And then the other one is Damages with <clears throat> Glenn Close. And th these are both fantastic shows, but I think every character in these shows, from the main character to all of the ancillary characters, provide just a brilliant illustration of the way that our ego works. Because all of these characters are obsessed with game playing and strategizing and double crossing uh, the other and seeing the world only in terms of their self-interest. And of course, every victory that they have mires them in about 15 other defeats. It's, it's compelling television, but it's not a compelling way to actually live your life that way. And that's what the ego wants, because the ego's survival, our lower self-survival, depends on strategizing. 
It depends on game plan. It you know, you can think of conflict in your life arising.